Hello everyone, Ian Wishart here with the continuing delight of presenting to you the Take A Pew podcast. Alongside me, as reliable as Planck's constant, is Simon Clark. Hello everybody. Um, sorry Ian, I wasn't really listening. Did you just call me a Plank? Absolutely not, Simon. I was just saying how dependable you are. Anyway, do you remember what I told you about our guest today? Yes, mate. Today we're going to be meeting the Queen of Cathedral Cheddar, Diane Williams, who is apparently rather irreverent. OK, I, I think that's almost entirely, or in fact entirely wrong, mate. We are actually meeting with the Dean of Guildford Cathedral, the very Reverend Diana Williams. Well, I was quite close, wasn't I? Uh, no, you clearly weren't listening during our briefing, which is ironic because Diana was a sound engineer for many years before switching to the vicar trade. Ooh, sounds fun. And very Reverend, eh? That's a first for us. We've had three right Reverends, but not a very. Which is best? Well, I don't think it's really a competition, mate. Anyway, as I said, Diana is currently the Dean of Guildford, which I think basically means that she oversees the life and work of the cathedral and its role as the spiritual base of the diocese. Although I'm sure she will explain it much better than that as we get on with the show. So let's do just that. This is the Take a Pew podcast with the very Reverend Diana Williams. Diana Williams. <laughs> Here we are indeed on Stag Hill, overlooking the glorious Surrey town of Guildford. And that's because that is where you will find the Cathedral Church of the Holy Spirit, better known as Guildford Cathedral. And we are here to meet Cathedral Dean, the very Reverend Diana Williams. Diana, thank you for having us here. And please, take, take a pew. pew. Thank you. Hello, Diana. It's great to meet you. Perhaps you could just introduce yourself to our lovely listeners. Um, my name's Diana Williams, and I'm actually Dean of Guildford, not Dean oh, of Guildford right. Cathedral. Everyone makes that mistake. Oh, no. <laughs> and, um, so perhaps more of that later. Yep. Uh, I'm 66. I've got a husband who's a stonemason, two children and five grandchildren. And I was ordained deacon in 1992 and ordained priest in 1994. And that's my current role as Dean of Guildford. And every diocese has a dean, whether or not it has a, a cathedral, it would still have a dean. Deans work with the bishop to provide ministry across the whole of the diocese and in particular have responsibility for leadership of everything that happens in the cathedral. Right, very good. Well, thank you for setting us straight on that one. Now we're looking forward to taking the usual Take A Pew journey with you, a sightseeing tour which will take in a look at your experiences so far in this thing we call life, a sneaky peek at some of your favourite things, and the sweeping vista that is your fabulous take a pew dinner party. And also your view on a biblical poser in Is It True? The enlightenment that comes from your spiritual pearl of wisdom. And of course, the glorious panorama that will be my random question. Hmm, yes, that is the unfortunate blot on the landscape. But anyway, let's get going. Diana, where did life start for you? I understand that it was somewhere that smelt of pickled walnuts. Um... I don't know about that. I was born. <laughs> I was oh, born. Just a guess. I was <laughs> born in Colorado, in the United States, oh, yes. <laughs> and I uh, lived there for two years. And then my family moved to California following my father's uh, job, and that's where I spent the majority then of the first twenty years. Wow, that sounds sounds a cool place to live, California. Yeah. It's a better place to visit than to live. Oh, uh, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, we do. A spoiler alert: I do know that you left there, but. Uh, uh, when you had the chance, but it sounds very exotic to us. But uh, And to get, help us get a flavour for those early years, uh, we have our first regular feature for you, which is... What were you like at school? Were you a little bit geeky? Or were you a little bit freaky? Or were you a little bit cheeky? What were you like at school? Yes, what were you like at school? Um, what was I like? I... I I think I was uh, academically gifted. I was part of a program in California that um, it was a test to put some year one children into year two after Christmas. Uh -huh. And yeah. then they and then the researchers followed us until we were 21. And so I love school. I love absolutely every day of school. And um, so I think I was just like everyone else. Yeah, <laughs> Did you have a good gang of friends? 
Yes, I did. Yeah, in high school, I had a great, a, a great gang of friends, yeah. and yeah. Um, that's always part of it, isn't it? In school, to be able to have a great gang of friends. It, it makes, and, um, makes a difference. Always well behaved. Did you ever get in, into any trouble at no, all? No, we never no? did. No, we were very good, and. Um, uh, no, we didn't get in any trouble at all, unfortunately. <laughs> Lots of people Honest. did. Our high schools are, are huge in California, so there's yeah. a thousand in each year. So um, they're much more regulated when you've got that many people on one yeah, site. A thousand in wow. each year? In each year. My and goodness. So, yes. And outside school, what was the family unit like? Uh, my family, I've got two younger brothers and a mum and dad. And um, I think that probably outside school, most of it was spent with friends. Really, I hung around with... Uh, my closest friends were uh, Irish and Italian Americans. They were all Roman Catholics, and oh, the yeah. church figured very largely in their lives, and therefore in everybody's lives um, of children. That's how I came to faith within Roman Catholic Church. Yes. Oh, okay, that's interesting. And was that was it a Christian family that you you'd grown no, up in? Anyway? No, 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 no. I didn't. It was. So I you were blazing a trail. Well, not really. Yeah. I think they. Uh, my mother certainly was. Um, she was a nominal Anglican and would go to church at Christmas and Easter and right, so on. Yeah. And I was confirmed when I was 14 and I, I remember that. But it was not long after that that actually the claims of Christ were something that I wanted to look at for myself. And that was from within the Roman Catholic tradition. Okay. What about hobbies and interests? You talked about hanging out with your friends. The biggest thing that we did was um, we were all petrol heads. And oh, wow. um, the... In the United States, you learn to drive in school. It's one of the lessons, just ordinary, you know, period four is, is driving. And um, so your, your probation, what's it called? Provisional license yeah. is 15 and a half. And then you, you take your test at 16. Okay. So but it was all about being petrol heads, building and racing cars. Oh, wow. So doing mechanics as part of that? Actually, yes. Stripping things down? And, yes, yes. Yeah, wow. Yeah, no, no, we got a number of awards. They were very fast. Wow. <laughs> we're wow. a very fast pit team. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. Oh, oh, very interesting. Well, um, and I think we'd, we'll, we'll find out that you went to uh, went on to college after well, university uh, after yeah. school. But just before we do that, we have our next regular feature, another question for you, which is... What's your fondest childhood memory? What's your fondest, what's your fondest of all your childhood memories? What's your fondest? What's your fondest? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Golly, you've got to pick just one. Yes. Yeah. There's one, I bet there's one that just comes yeah. straight to mind. If you don't well, the, one that did, no, the one I didn't think about too much, it did come straight to mind, is that um, having two weeks of vacation with my grandmother and my father's mother in Colorado. And that was something that I looked forward to from the minute we came home until the next summer so that was a very fond childhood what was so special about that was it just spending time or it, was, was, it, it, it? it was spending time with her but it was yeah. also being in Colorado so the landscape for that I've always found very life-giving and just a different pace I think uh, but it's probably was being with her yeah yeah so were there other when you said there's how to choose one or other things that come to mind the, well, the other things that come to mind is the stuff that had to do with being a petrol head. Right, uh, yeah. So Same it had to do general. with racing and building, and yeah. um, we built and raced Formula V cars, right. V is five. You know, that yes, kind of yep. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there's a lot of that involved in that. Yeah, wow. so is there any stuff. particular moment that you, you think back on? I, it was all just big and good. Just great <laughs> joy throughout. What a joyful, <laughs> yeah, a joyful youth. It, it's wonderful, but. Uh, well, anyway, as I said, you did go on to uh, University of California. I did, I think, and yeah. studied something quite geeky. I think it, was, it probably was geeky. Yeah. Yes, I, yes. I I went up to um, read maths, which is what I loved. I've loved since I was a, a little girl, and it was taught so badly. I was I was in tears. It never occurred to me anybody could teach maths badly, and um, because I was on this program and being monitored and things, I had slightly more leeway in terms of the total amount of lessons I could do. And I happened to be wandering past, you could go into any classes, your first year is a four year degree course, your first year is general studies, so you do lots and lots of things, you don't specialise until your second, third and fourth year. And I wandered past a physics lesson and it was an absolute amazing thing, it was you know, <laughs> physics, the beginning of physics, but on the board, 
the teacher was talking about torque, which I knew about because I invented course. torsion bar suspension, and he put an equation up that showed what torque was in real life. And I just could, I thought that's for me. So I went to see whether I could change from reading math to physics. And the trouble was I had never done physics at school. So that was a bit of a difficulty. And um, I also was doing a minor in chemistry and I wanted to change that to two, two majors as it were. But I was told if I did essentially the equivalent of A level between September and December, I could swap to reading physics in January and then I could keep chemistry as a double honors. So I did physics and chemistry, two separates as, as honors. But physics wow. was the answer to everything. Physics was great. <laughs> I, I know very little about it. The, the I little I know about physics is having watched the film Oppenheimer a couple of weeks ago. That's, oh, right. that's, about, that's the closest I've come to, uh, <laughs> to physics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I did A level physics, but then I went on to do biology afterwards. I did like physics. We had a great teacher, brilliant teacher. It makes all the difference yeah it? really really good Makes teacher all that the brought difference. it to life yeah, yeah. it's fantastic yeah. so no I, yeah. I just loved physics and chemistry yeah. oh, that's wonderful so it came swanning out of university mm. what happened next on life's journey i don't think i did <laughs> <laughs> you've met me and i'm not built to swan um <laughs> they we were all of us together, it was a wonderful time to come to faith in the early 70s in California. It was the very beginning of the mega church movement. Oh. Calvary Chapel was the first one. That's where we were. We went to Calvary Chapel in the evening and we'd, um, that was much later. And then sensibly, the Roman Catholic Mass was at 5.15 because by, on Sunday, because by then teenagers are awake. <laughs> Genius. So we went to, we went to Mass at 5.15, that finished at 7. And then we went over to Calvary Chapel at 7.30 for, you know, music and worship songs and Bible study and things like that. And I was really privileged to be able to be a part of the very, very earliest Maranatha music when Christian music was beginning uh, and offering as an engineer I never am in front of the audience. And so I had been doing that through going through university in the last year of high school and so on. And that was helpful doing physics because then I focused yeah, on acoustics cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. and did sound engineering. And then I uh, finished university and, but just prior to that, probably a week prior to that, I had a vision and it wasn't, I mean, a hallucination, a proper vision. And in that, I believe that God was saying that he would send me to England, which of course I didn't know where it was. I knew where it was. <laughs> I'm American so after all. Colorado, yes. <laughs> and it, that was very, very bizarre. And then I decided that I needed to take it really seriously because it was a proper vision. I shared it with one Christian friend who I trusted. And then three days later, just before I was going to college for my final exam, uh, I got a phone call from a fellow that had brought his band over to California some weeks before and they borrowed our kit and we'd done some stuff together and so on. And he said, there's a Christian musical that's, that's starting on tour on Sunday. This was Wednesday on Sunday and our sound engineers just dropped out. Can you come? And so one more part of me said, you know, I wanted to throw myself on my knees and ask God what to do, but I'm not that stupid. And um, so I said yes, and that was Wednesday, and on Sunday I was in London. Wow, goodness wow. me. <laughs> so where did you stay in London when you when you came to London? We were on tour immediately. Yeah. So yeah. I heard the show on the Sunday night at um, Methodist Central Hall, and then Monday the tech crew left to go up to Aberdeen, which is where we were starting. And we needed to stop off in Lincoln to get some stuff. Then we went straight up to Hampered so that we were there when the yeah. cast arrived. Okay. And then for six months, we're traveling in England. Goodness me. And you, you kept doing so rather than toddling off and getting ordained at some point, which would have been difficult then, I suppose, <laughs> in the Church of England, wouldn't it? Um, you spent quite a lot of time pursuing that particular vocation. I did. Once, yeah. the, once the children came along, I stopped doing live work because okay. you, it, you, know, you have a um, nocturnal existence where you... Mm. You, you don't start work to 10 at night, you finish at three in the morning. Mm. And so I um, went freelance designing sound systems for new and refurbished buildings because I could do that at home. And my um, my son, he was quite happy to go on site in a little hard hat and a baby carrier. But then I had his sister and she's normal. <laughs> that was not going to work. So anyway, we adapted to those things. Yeah. How did you find, did you manage to get along to churches as you were traveling around this was this was a christian musical so um, so you felt like you were at church anyway we were at church every way because every <laughs> yes. night it was, right um it was led by a wonderful woman called jean darnell and um the prior they 
but they were just before the Fountain Trust and all of that. Um, she was from Foursquare. And so, yes, everybody, there was a, a, always proper stuff, an altar call every night. And, oh, we, and we played in oh, major okay. places. Um, oh. And there was a local cast that had been practicing the, the backing music, as it were. And then we took the front of house cast and all the technical things. So, you no, know, we did. She'd had a wonderful vision that God has showed her flames of fire on different cities in Britain. And uh, essentially shared that and got support. And it, it was actually amazing. And so yeah. we went to those places where the flames of fire had landed. Wow. And how was it know. received? Was it? Oh, really? The well, they're packed. We played at the um, Royal Albert Hall. That's where oh, we finished. Wow. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, Usher Hall in Birmingham, in, in yeah. Edinburgh. Um, all the major Fantastic. places, huge, huge, 3,000 people in a tent on um, Jesus College, uh, Jesus Common in Cambridge, and then at Dale Abbey outdoors. I don't know how many people there were. There must have been 10 or 12,000 people um, in Derby. So in quite the a big gig, then. Yeah, it was very big. <laughs> big gig. It was a very big gig. You'll have to, you'll have to explain to me uh, later on, perhaps uh, after we've finished, uh, how you get the sound to come out at the same time depending how to <laughs> no matter how far you are away from the stage i've never known how people do that it's incredible it's very very we clever. did it without computers as really well. Well. Yeah, of course yeah. we did oh yes this is when dinosaurs were on the earth since <laughs> so um so that was late 70s but by the time we get to the sort of early 90s mm -hmm. you've uh, started following uh, the ordination mm -hmm. path how did that come about i don't really know ian i uh, it I was, I remember where I was standing in the doorway of my living room and it came over me like a sneeze that God was asking me to do something else, which I remonstrated with the Almighty about because I was jolly busy and a very active lay person in church as we all are and so on. Uh, but then it pranged in my head about ordination where well, I was a very very low Anglican church where the difference between priests and deacons wasn't not you know just wasn't it. and so I talked to my vicar about it and he explained women couldn't be ordained priests but they could be ordained deacon because this was 87 so it's just it happened then being ordained deacon and so went through that process and was ordained deacon in 92. And then actually the then ordained as a priest I think in 94, was yes, it? Yeah, first which was the first mm -hmm. time, wasn't it? I mean, great, how great to be part of that event. It must have been, must have felt yes. even more special than. It, it feels more special as I look back. At the time, it was just, I was just doing what I was supposed to do. Yeah, just being obedient. Yeah. Is it, because I did wonder about, because there were, there are other denominations, obviously, where mm. it could have been ordained mm. prior to that. I suppose that was never a, a question. Oh, no, 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 not, not, not. When, when I came to Britain, the Roman Catholic priest uh, in the United States at our church, he, he was very helpful in discerning and helped me discern the fact that because of two things, one, um, my love of scripture, which I got from him, and then also some of the polity of the Roman Catholic church, that my future was not, as a disciple, was not going to live within that tradition. And then that was a week before I came here, uh, the witness organized with Jean Darnell, essentially people from all faith, all Christian traditions. And then it was sent out from St. Mark's Kennington, which is an uh, Anglican church at the Oval in London. Mm. And so it, that was a kind of spiritual home from where we were set out and prayer support and so on. And so then when, when the six months were over and I knew I should stay in England, they started to worship there. Yes. So, so yeah, firmly Church, Church of England, England. England by that time. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And nothing wrong with that, might I add. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so there then ensued a period of curacies and mm -hmm. assistant curacies and so and yeah. largely in london i think was it yes yeah. southern diocese yeah. south of the river the uh, god's own diocese <laughs> uh, would i still say that yes so <laughs> i i had uh, yeah i had two wonderful curacies in those days right. there were two available so that was terrific yes. i was a curate at one church a church in peckham where the where we where, what we grew up we spent 22 years there for the children grew up and we, and then um, did my second curacy at, the, at one of the next door churches, still in South East London. And then uh, the vicar left and the role was vacant. And I had never applied for a job ever because I'm a self-employed sound engineer. So I thought it would be good practice. And I knew that the candidates would get driven around the parish in a minibus 
and that whoever got the job would be my boss. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll apply. <laughs> uh, and anyway, so I was shortlisted and interviewed and and um, and got the job. Much yeah, yeah. to my surprise. <laughs> How did you found the sort of the transition from being so very scientifically based, mm -hmm. sound engineer, physics, numbers? to then standing up in front of mm. congregations, studying mm. scripture and, and really getting into that sort of literary side of things. Was this just a natural transition for you? No, the scripture came before. It was a wonderful time in the denominations in the United States, the beginning of the Casillo movement, the charismatic renewal in both the Anglican and the Roman Catholic Church, huge masses at the Rose Bowl, Pasadena, 100,000 young people. And so that love that of scripture, yeah. that, that was there already. When I went to train for ordination, that was the biggest, not surprise, but I had to work at it because for physics, you start at A and you go into Z and it might take decades and decades and decades and there's blips along the way. Um, but with theology, everybody starts at the same place and then everybody goes, hmm. You know, and I just, show me the equation. And so that was, but it was really, really uh, wonderful to be able to do something that was a completely different discipline. Mm. and then. Many years later, I did my master's at King's College London in um, youth ministry and theological education, and that was very social science based. So was a, there was a lot of reading to yeah. do, and uh, no, but I, I I appreciated that. Yeah, I, yeah, I liked it. I don't know anything, <laughs> but I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> so after a, after quite a few years in and around various places in London, you were then called to glorious Surrey um, to become the Dean of Guildford. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Yay! Yes, yes. Which is actually what I've got written down here. I don't know why it's I say cathedral earlier. Everyone so, does. I know. So well, I, well I've well. learned something today. But, um, and again, that was a, we talked about 94 and the first tranche of women mm. being ordained. I mean, that was, there weren't too many female deans, I guess, at that point. I think at that point, uh, because people have moved and retired and so on. But I think at that time I was the seventh mm -hmm. out of 42. So there's always been a, well, not always, Diana, because we weren't ordained until 94. But <laughs> currently there is a higher percentage of women who are deans than our diocesan bishops, for example. Oh. So there's about 20% of us. So I wasn't the first woman dean by any no, any no. stretch, yeah. But it's still relatively pioneering. Probably, yeah. yeah. I it, can it say never, that. You, yeah. would, you wouldn't say that, like but that. I, I no. can say that. And that was um, actually about, ten, well, 10 years ago. Yes, yes. And obviously you're just coming up to finishing off that role next yeah. month yeah, as, that's we, right. as we record. That's right. That'll be uh, entertaining. We'll come back to that in, in due course. But so what we touched on what a dean sort of does. So how, mm. how would you typify the day to day activity of a dean? Golly. Oh, you're going to say all sorts of things, aren't you? But well, <laughs> yeah, well, is yes yeah, i said this about all my jobs, but it's the best job in the world. The, the variety is a he, huge blessing. And um, one of the factors of being a dean is whereby in a parish, there's a, a, a nexus of leadership and management that the vicar has to do some management and some leadership and a bit of both. And there's people to help with the management. But the way a cathedral governance is, all cathedrals by statute have got a chief operating officer and who is responsible for the lay staff and all that management. So for a dean, it's more heavily weighted on the leadership, which is about ethos and culture and so on. And there is a, and because of wonderful colleagues, there is almost built in an expect, well, no, there isn't. There is built in an expectation that there's enough of a helicopter view that's built into each day and week. So that's in terms of the diocese, the geographical diocese. For our setting, we're almost entirely the county of Surrey, so there's also that civic focus. And within the within the geographical diocese, you know, 1.3 million people living in Surrey, there's our parishes with their schools and all the other things that go on, charities and so on. And being able to always be attuned to how can we bring value to what's already going on and seeking to extend God's kingdom because most of the stuff that's happening it's not from happening from us it's happening all around mm -hmm. and that's a huge privilege to be able to do that and that is very very varied gosh you're going to I don't want to leap ahead too much but you're going to miss all that aren't you I will, yes. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. I'm keeping on some of it. I'm a deputy lieutenant in Surrey mm, and um, yeah. uh, one commits to that until 75. So oh, I will yeah. have a little bit more time to give to serving Surrey in that way. 
and of course it's been an, an interesting 10 years for Guildford Cathedral mm -hmm. hasn't it I mean yeah. you, I guess you, there's been a big restoration project in that time well or, there's been a fixing mm -hmm. project in that time it is considerably easier to spend seven million than to raise it <laughs> <laughs> so much easier and my wonderful colleagues is starting just before I came uh, we together we raised seven million pounds which was able to do some work much needed to the interior of the building a uh, poor decision was made in the 70s oh no no 60s probably to spray some plaster on the ceiling and um, that plaster had asbestos in it's all plaster oh, did. Yeah. and so it was quite right we took it off and mm. while we had all that scaffolding in 250,000 tons of it uh, we did everything oh else at high level because no one's going to do that again. So we were able to revamp the sound system, the lighting and the wiring and all that kind of thing too while we were there and then restore it to the way the architect intended it. Did you, did you get, did you meddle in the sound system? Naturally. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't meddle in the sound system. We were very fortunate. The Tonmeister, the University of Surrey, which trains um, sound engineers and it's one of the finest places in the world to train. Uh, engineers, the Tonmeister, some students, they did the acoustic modeling for us, so how it would be once we'd taken off the plaster. Um, and the building was built to have a voice of its own, which is why there's no speakers in there now. Um, so the building speaks, it's got point sources. And there was no electricity in it, he didn't put any in, the architect didn't. And so we were able to model that thanks to the Tonmeister. And so, I, no, I didn't meddle. I took a keen interest <laughs> keen in interest. A keen interest <laughs> in. Did you review the modelling and scrutinise it? <laughs> I did some it. of my own modelling side you? by side. Yes, yes. Right, using slide rules. But there we are. <laughs> They're fantastic colleagues Great. at the University yeah. of Surrey. So it's been, it's been quite a, a journey, I guess, with the last... 10 years overall yes it's been that that bit of it was really quite concentrated in yes. just under two years that was a lot have all that scaffolding yeah. and so on and how did uh, how did lockdown impact everything because particularly we're looking out across a whole county and suddenly not being able to get out and about that must have been quite difficult it, it, it was but as again it was for everyone obviously but that's yeah. right but for us as as colleagues uh, fellow clergy we um because we're not a parish Many cathedrals have a parish, a geographical parish. We haven't. So the the regular people we have, we know who they are because they're in the congregations. So we could divide up and make sure we all kept in touch with each mm. other. And our musicians and us as clergy rose to the challenge of being able to produce online worship. So we we did that really well, I think. And then eventually we could do everybody discovered Zoom and stuff. So yes. online advent groups and Lent groups and that, you know, it which was everybody a, else did it was a great catalyst for um innovation and creativity wasn't mm. it and there's no going back yes. is there yeah, no. yeah i can remember suddenly in our place we went and dave actually who's recording us today is uh looks after the, the sound and the av basically mm. in our parish and um i remember we were sitting around debating when we could stream services and mm. it was all kind of well, you know, two or three years, you know, give it a bit longer. And then all of a sudden it's like, right, next week. Yes, <laughs> that's exactly yeah. what it was like. So we like. just got on with it. Yeah. Yes, we did. Absolutely. They, everyone learnt to film in landscape. It was one, yes. wonderful time. <laughs> wonderful time. No, it's very good. So that's obviously keeps you. You mentioned the deputy lieutenant role. I think mm -hmm. you're school governor still, are you? No, I, oh, I was I the school governor for about 40 years, but yeah. when I came here, I didn't have time for that. So oh, I joined okay. a multi-academy trust, our right. diocesan one, as a trustee. Yes. And I think eight, nine years, but I've, I've concluded that now, and okay. I serve as chair of the trustee. But education, so, obviously, is a huge passion. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And then, are you still involved with Homestart? Yes, I'm a patron of Homestart. Yes, yes Homestart Guildford. Yes, it yes, is, yes. absolutely. All donations welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I saw that. I'm looking so at the website. <laughs> Very good. We'll, we'll plug that. Yeah, definitely. we will, definitely. Yeah. So, uh, so plenty, to, plenty to keep you going, but... Um, when you do get, oh, I some. am a school governor. I yes, I'm a yeah. school governor at Charterhouse. Oh, Charterhouse and at Epsom oh, wow. College. Okay, apart <laughs> I do from know that, this, yes, yeah. Um, yeah, apart from minor details. Apart from those two major <laughs> education establishments, yes, both wonderful schools. It's a yeah, privilege yeah, to serve. My first foray into being a governor of an independent school this is always yeah. in the state yeah. sector beforehand. Yeah. So it's good learning for me too. Well, lots to keep you busy then. But when you do get some spare time, how do you like to spend it? 
Doing podcasts, obviously. Apart, <laughs> apart from <laughs> doing podcasts. <laughs> We're still, I, still I, fiddling about with motor cars? No, I'm not fiddling about oh. with motor cars. They're too boring nowadays. Yeah, um, they are, aren't they? Yeah. They are just boring. And um, uh, no, I love gardening, so I do lots of gardening. And uh, laterally, God has granted me five grandchildren. And so oh. spare time spent with them is yes, a huge lovely. blessing. Are, yeah. they, are they all fairly local? Yes, they are. Oh, well, even yes, they better. Are. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. It's very, very nice. Well, I'm pleased at that stage to report that I've had news that the kitchen are very nearly ready mm. to serve up some sumptuous fare for our dinner party. <laughs> and that means that it's time to squeeze in a little game of My Favourite Things. <laughs> My favourite things. Yes, this is a very simple game, Diana. We give you a series of categories, and all you have to do is tell us your favourite thing in each. Yes, as easy as pie. And our first category is always your favourite book of the Bible. Oh, favourite book of the Bible? Blimey. Um, favourite book of the Bible. You have read the Bible, I take it. Yes, <laughs> I have. Yes, yes. It's a good start. It's a library. Um, my favourite book will be Job. Oh. That's my favourite book of the Bible. It's where I turn to Job for um, the wonderful creation stories and the poetry. I love the fact that it never has a finish. It doesn't finish. Job never figures out. It, nobody ever tells him the conversation that happened beforehand. Um, yeah. But it's that it's the wonderful creation passages in Job, which are, um, yeah. I just think they're terrific. I, I love those. The stars, the chaos, the galaxies, um, all of that. So my favourite book as well, of course. It is we your favourite book. It is indeed. Oh, and we've had it a couple of times, haven't we? Is this well, one? yeah, once or twice. Yeah. So it's not it's not just 42 chapters of misery then? No, not at no. all. No, okay. no, not at all. Oh, it's fabulous. <laughs> it's fabulous. That's excellent choice. Okay. <laughs> now, Diana, we're here today on Stag Hill, of which I'm sure you're very fond. But other than here, What's your favourite hill? Hill. Yes. Favourite, mm. favourite, favourite hill. Obvious Ooh. question, I know. It yes. is. A, yes, yeah, it's it an is obvious question. question. I ought to be able to answer it, shouldn't I? <laughs> My favourite <laughs> hill. Oh golly! Can I have a? Can I have a, a thing like? Can I have the South Downs? Or yes. yes. Oh, fine. Yes. I'll yes. take that. Take the South Downs. I'll take the South Downs. Good Thank choice. <laughs> Very good choice. That's a series of hills. Yes, yes a series of hills. Yeah. I'll have yes. a series of hills. That's right. <laughs> okay, so our third category is always a top five. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been this season doing top five films, but you tipped us off in advance that you can't remember any films whatsoever. So we're not going to ask you that. So we'd like to know <laughs> your top five pieces of music. Well, I have, I, I don't know why. Um, I just, this is the five. Yeah. Uh, send in the clowns. Ooh. I forgot who wrote it. Me and Ian yeah, reminded you of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it came to mind. <laughs> Immediately came to mind the first one. I've not seen why it came to mind. <laughs> send in the clowns. Um, farewell to Stromness. Uh, Barbara Zadar. Oh, 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 fabulous. Peter Maxwell Davis. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Field of Gold by Sting. Oh, and yes, Hotel yes. California by the Eagles. Brilliant. What a, what a great. Was that five? Or was no, that four? Five, five. Five. Barbara Zadar for Strings may have got lost when you were trying to think of Farewell. Oh, right. Oh. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Gosh, what a, what a wow, wonderful that's... selection. You could quite happily pass the time listening to that couldn't you? You, could, you could take it yeah. now our penultimate category is in fact itself a series of categories what we call the great eight so eight quick fire categories approved by the british medical council for use in professional psychometric testing <laughs> i don't believe you it's true it's, it's true. absolutely, it is absolutely true. Not is necessarily true, true <laughs> we must admit it's, yeah so here we go eight quick fire categories um starting with your favorite author I know this. I know this. My favourite <laughs> author, I'm going to say Agatha Christie. Oh, excellent. Favourite type of food? Ooh, uh, British. Okay, anything, anything, what do you think of when you Roasted think of British or? food? Yeah, yeah, that kind of stuff. Oh, roast, oh, yeah. okay. Nice roast dinner. Nice roast. Yeah. Okay. okay, fine. All right, your favourite television programme? Of all time? Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness me. Did you, did you warn me about this? Because I don't remember getting this memo. <laughs> no, no. Um, <laughs> My favourite television programme of all time, golly, it'll be something like Downton Abbey or one of those that, you know, Call the Midwife. No, I want Call the Midwife. Call the Midwife. That's, that's it. That's a great choice. Yeah, I want we'll, Call the Midwife. Yeah, you can have that. Yes. Excellent. Favourite sport? 
basketball. Oh, oh a quick answer. Your favourite band or musical artist? Obviously had a couple in the list. Oh, but. man. Uh, I, I don't really, but what I'm more likely to play is uh, the Eagles. That's oh, they're a marvellous choice. Favourite holiday destination? Oh, somewhere in the UK. I, yes, um, we. There is one place that we really enjoy going to, which is in the Cairngorms, called Newton Moor, a little place called Newton mm. in the Cairngorms, and that's that's wonderful. Fantastic. Newton Moor, hi. Mm. Uh, right, your favourite chocolate bar? It would be. Uh, a dark chocolate bar. I can't think of anyone who makes a dark chocolate bar. There's little green and black ones. Yeah, yeah. green dark and black. Dark chocolate. Hundred percent cocoa. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which would probably it kill you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, your favourite board game. Scrabble. Oh, good one. very quick yes, answer. That's good. Well, that was that was the great eight, and we I think probably the quickest yeah, we've yeah. done the great. Yeah, eight. That's oh, very good. Yeah, very very good. good. And our final category of my favourite things is always multiple choice. <laughs> I'll give you three possible answers, so, so don't worry. With your former profession in sound engineering, you've obviously used a lot of microphones. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to know your favourite mic. Now, three possible answers: <laughs> acting icon Michael Caine, art icon. Michelangelo <laughs> or fashion icon Mike Cardigan. Oh, Mike Cardigan. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you really yeah. like it? Seriously? I do. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go for that. Good. I wore it especially <laughs> just for that one comment. You can take it off there. And it's very <laughs> warm. It's a very warm <laughs> day. So, Ma Michael Caine, no, misses out to Mike. Uh, Mike mm. Michelangelo did some good stuff, didn't he? Yeah. He did a lot of stuff, yes. He was very, very clever. Yeah. You might also have had a very nice cardigan, you never know. It's very possible. I don't, I don't know when cardigans were invented. It's not. That's a good question. Man. We'll find that out. Can you find that out? Yeah. Can you research that later yeah, we'll on? Some but, uh, well, some truly life affirming revelations there once again in my favourite things. And all that hard work was worth the effort because. It's the fabulous Take a Butte dinner party. The miraculous Take a Butte dinner party. The food is quite irrelevant and some of the guests are hot. It's the impractical, fantastical Take a Butte dinner party. <clears throat> <laughs> yes, Diana, it's time for your fabulous Take a Butte dinner party. A quick reminder of the rules. Obviously, you can have all of your family and friends at the party, but there remain four empty chairs for you to fill. Yes, and to do that, you have to select one person from any time in history, dead or alive, a cartoon character, mm -hmm. and a non-domesticated animal. And then on the final chair, we find a gramophone player, which will play the single piece of music of your choice throughout the dinner. So, Diana, your first choice, the one person from the whole of history that you would choose to join you for dinner. And remember, it can't be anyone who appears in the Bible or any of your family. No, this is neither. It's a lady called Anne Sullivan, and she was Helen Keller's teacher. Um, Helen Keller was deafblind uh, in the late 19th century, and uh, Anne Sullivan was also partially sighted. And it was the first biography I read probably as I was eight or nine um, and I was just mesmerized by the I read the biography of Anne Sullivan uh, and how she taught Helen Keller and then she's quite famous in the United States I don't know about here but um, and I would love to to speak with Anne Sullivan about that wow that's right. I, haven't, I haven't come across no, it I but I know my wife has learnt a lot of sign language mm. just because she wanted to, mm. and so and I know she she's huge admiration for Helen Keller, so she's probably mm. come across mm. Anne Sullivan. But she would Anne Sullivan yeah. was her teacher. Yeah. Wonderful. Oh, wonderful. Sounds wonderful. like a mm. great vocation. Going back mm. to how good teachers are, isn't it? Yes, very good. But um, okay, so that's that's the yes. actual person and mm. joining Ms. Sullivan, mm. a cartoon character. I would love to have Lucy from Peanuts. <laughs> oh, wow. I love Peanuts. Um, Lucy is a professional big sister, and um, as am I. And she, <laughs> I just always, always loved Lucy since I was a little tiny girl. So I would love to have Lucy from Peanuts. That's a great, that's a, it's an obvious choice, really. I, yeah, we haven't had anything characters that's from Peanuts. Yeah, have we? No, we haven't. Um, and then we have the non domesticated mm. animal. Mm. I have gone for a Canada goose. Ooh. Um, they're beautiful animals. 
and they there's a particular time of the year in the autumn it's different from the United States uh, and they fly together and they fly in formation and when the first one gets tired she or he drops to the back and another one takes over and I think this is they're, they're beautiful animals and the way they communicate with each other and they can fly so that would be yeah. it. Now, I will have to speak to the kitchen because we don't want to serve oh, geese, no. do we? No, we no, no that would be no that would be bad. Be, yeah, we, <laughs> we wouldn't fun. really want that. Um, it also, it could be a little bit messy. Is my only concern. Well, that is well, Canada geese are not as messy as the geese that get in the way of all our other waterways here. Oh, okay. So that's, yeah. Do they make a lot of noise? Do they do they you, honk to one they another. They honk a lot. Yeah, but, they, yeah. They, but it's the direction. So, okay. thing, yeah. so it'd be a good conversation, wouldn't it, I suppose? Yeah, they'd, yeah. They'd, <laughs> they'd, co they'd contribute. They could honk a lot. <laughs> they could honk along, yeah. I've yeah. just come back from Canada, actually. and uh, yeah. Did you see lots of geese? I did, yeah. 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 Wonderful creatures, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Well done. Love them. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's a great assembled yeah. company there, and we just then have one single piece of music to play repeatedly throughout the dinner. Now, we've had your five favourite pieces of music. It may well be one of those to repeat, or it could be something else. I think I would choose Farewell to Stromness because um, it it bears repeating mm. it repeats mm. itself in the composition any case it doesn't the, the ones that have got words that's just too complicated because people want to listen to the words so i think i i could easily not irritate people by playing farewell to stromness yes the entire time be a good solid background music yes. wouldn't yeah. it well, I, I hope that you get to enjoy such a fine gathering before too long. <laughs> I'm sure you will. And talking of the future, and before we get to the rather more intellectual and, dare I say, spiritual part of the show, it's time for us to ask you... Twelve to... years from now, what would you like to be doing? Or would it mainly be the same? Or would you rather be canoeing for a summer? Yes, just an example. <laughs> yes, Diana, obviously a significant change coming up for you very soon. But looking further out, what would you like us to be talking about if we were having this conversation with you 12 years from now? Oh, well, I hope I'm still alive, as <laughs> number one. Yeah, I think we'll take that as yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, so, OK, so let's assume <laughs> that that's right. Um, 12 years from now, it's quite nice thinking about that because it... Uh, my eldest would be on the way to university 12 years from now. Mm. Uh, my eldest grandchild, grandchild. grandchild um, yeah. 12 years from now, and that would be uh, lovely. The, I'm very interested to see how my vocational journey, my vocation as a baptized person, and continues to unfold. So I don't know what bit that would take, but I would, I would hope that in 12 years I could look back and just see how God continued to guide me as God's guided me uh, so far in very odd ways <laughs> and I'm assuming that some of that's going to be equally odd and <laughs> so I would like to be able to look back and know that I've been of some assistance to my family and my community or wherever that is and who knows is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. who knows? Well, still, still plenty you. to play for yeah. so you may have another another vision involving yes. I could Egypt do. or somewhere. Well, I, yeah. I, I could do, yes. I've not <laughs> had knows? one since. How bizarre it would be if that actually happened now, wouldn't that it? That would be very <laughs> bizarre, Ian. That would confirm my prophetic anointing. <laughs> very good. Well, we wish you every blessing wherever life and the Lord may take you, Diane. Indeed we do. And we look forward to very shortly hearing your spiritual pearl of wisdom. But just before that, we'd be very grateful if you could spare a couple of minutes helping us with another Bible related dilemma in the little part of the show that we like to call. Is it true? Is it true? Is it true? Is it true? Yes, is it true? Don't look so worried. <laughs> Anyway, this time our attention has been caught by the famous story of Joshua and the Battle of Jericho, as recorded in the Bible in the book of Joshua chapter 6. And there we find the perhaps familiar tale of the Israelites in their first major skirmish since re-entering the Promised Land, seeking to capture the walled city of Jericho. And of course we read how Joshua and his people marched around the city walls for six days and seven times on the seventh day, after which the priest blew the horns, the people shouted, and the walls, as the song says, came tumbling down. Now, this gave us some pause for thought because it does seem odd 
that the blast of a trumpet could cause such obviously mighty fortifications to collapse. And then our minds turned to the mysterious manner that God had provided it for the Israelites in their journey through the wilderness leading up to the events at Jericho. Now, no one seems to be quite sure what manna was, but we think we found a clue because nowadays manna is the name given to the sticky, syrupy sap of certain trees in the Middle East. That is true. This is consistent with the Bible description of manna being sweet like honey. And accordingly, it clearly would have been very flammable. And it doesn't take much to connect the dots and deduce that the Israelites could have dried out loads of manna over 40 years, leaving them with, in effect, a large store of gunpowder. So, of course, when they get to Jericho, they simply walked around the city, laying down their high explosive, eventually blew their trumpets as a kind of keep clear warning, ignited the manna and blew the walls to pieces. And that seems to us a very credible explanation of what happened at Jericho three and a half thousand years ago. But... Dean Diana Williams. Is it true? 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 No. Oh. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> it's very creative, um, but it's, it's, it's it unbelievably can't possibly creative. be. It's unbelievably creative. Yes, it is, but it can't possibly be true. <laughs> no, oh, that, that's a shame because there were things like. Because gunpowder was always uh, held in powder horns. That's what they call the things they yes. keep gunpowder in. Yes. So those horns might not have been the ceremonial horns, mm. the shofar, I think they were called. Yes. They might have been the powder horns. And so then maybe they blew them to say they're all empty so we can blow it up now. But you don't think so, do no? I don't think so. I think no. that for one thing, Moses said to them not to gather any more than they needed for the yes. day. Yeah, and when they gather a little bit that. more, all the worms ate up their insides. Yes. Um, <laughs> and the word man means what is it yes. so it's oh. that what is it they couldn't have carted it around that no. that much mm. um well they, they might have called it what is it because if it were like gunpowder gum wasn't invented till the 9th century yes, so yes, they wouldn't yes, have, yes, they'd have yes, had no idea yes, what it was that's, that's of course they would have said what they were is eating it? gunpowder <laughs> I mean, yeah. is there any from a chemistry point of view is there any credence in you know the sweet like sort of dewy sap type stuff being flammable really yeah i think it would be wouldn't i think it would but it depends yeah. how aromatic it is yes yeah. that's yeah. true yes yeah. i think mm. it is. so it could be sweet without being aromatic yes yeah so i don't know having never experienced said sap yes. um <laughs> whether or not it is <laughs> aromatic or not <laughs> that's, that's something for the researchers isn't uh, it yes yes, yes, yes it, absolutely you've got your research and i'm going to have some research now i shall investigate the sap <laughs> thank you yes. very much that's very good. It's also the first time we've had the expression said sap on the show. <laughs> I like so, it. You're welcome. I'm, yeah, Thank particularly, you. Well, I think we can safely say that that's another Bible conspiracy theory itself blown away. Oh. Thank you. And with that, Diana, perhaps you could bless us with your spiritual pearl of wisdom. It's a spiritual pearl of wisdom. One of the things that's always struck me, um, the analogy, the sporting analogies, you know, running the race and all that kind of chalot, and I, I, I always have loved sport and participated in it, is in the letter to Timothy about running the race, it's just a finish the race, not a one. And that finishing is all that God asks of us is to be obedient and focused and continue to run the race. And the part of the reason of thinking about this is um, there was a, I think it was a lady from Norway who was a shot putter or, or something. And one of the Scandinavian countries had to field a woman in the hurdles or else they would have lost points from the Commonwealth, not the Commonwealth Games, the European games and so this shot putter or she looked like a shot putter she volunteered to run the hurdles which of course she can't run at all and but she finished the race you know she she stepped over each hurdle in turn and she finished the race she didn't win she never was going to run win but she did her very very best with what she was given and it was it's that finishing of the race doing the very best with what we're given and yes, focusing on the finishing line, uh, as the letter encourages us to focus on the finishing line. So that's we stay in lane. Um, it's not so that we're going to win. You don't give up once somebody else seems to cross it first. So that keeping on, keeping on and just being faithful to what God's called us to. 
It's a spiritual pearl of wisdom. Well, thank you very much for that, Diana. And that just leaves us with one final, if somewhat underwhelming, spectacle on our tour, namely... Simon's Random Question. Now, Simon, I was rather hopeful that you might tell us that you haven't got one of your questions this week. I would never dream of letting you down like that, Ian, would I? Trust me, I wouldn't be at all <laughs> disappointed. <laughs> No, really, we couldn't possibly have a show without a random question. And Diana, my random question for you is this. Dolly Parton or Stevie Wonder? Oh, sorry, I've missed a bit out. Yeah. Oh, I haven't done that for a while. Diana, my full question for you is this. If you were required as part of your end of office celebrations mm -hmm. to perform a karaoke duet in front of the entire General Synod, would you rather perform alongside Dolly Parton or Stevie Wonder? Yes. This is tricky because I am very proud of the fact that I have never, ever been on stage when there's been an audience in the house. Oh, wow. And right. um, so... <laughs> Which might, must have I taken some was, achieving. Given it did because we, yeah. we, 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 um, we set all the equipment on fire at the Wimbledon Playhouse uh, by some jiggery pokery, but Gosh. I did not go on stage to fix my equipment. The stage manager did that. So, <laughs> in which case, I would... Um, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I I really wouldn't. I really wouldn't do it. I would do anything necessary, but I I would I would I, I won't do it. I'm not meatloaf, but I won't do that. <laughs> so no, I'll do the sound. Okay. So yeah. if you had to delegate somebody, <laughs> Stevie to Wonder. Stevie Wonder. Stevie Wonder. Yes. Stevie Wonder. Yeah, yeah. but you'd have a lot. Yeah. Mind you, either of them. I mean, they're both brilliant, aren't they? they are actually, they are both yeah. brilliant. Stevie yeah. Wonder's just more my thing than Donald Trump. Yes, Parker. yes, yeah. no, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, me too. Mm. But uh, they both yeah. got a great catalogue. But uh, mm. so no, that's a great shame. So you don't think, any, regardless of the abs, the probable absence of Dolly Parton and Stevie Wonder <laughs> from <laughs> that particular meeting at the Synod, it's you never know. But um, so you, you wouldn't be tempted to. Never. You don't think a, a karaoke is going to feature in your, Never. In your goodbye Never. celebrations? No, not at all. That's very not impressive. Never. Yeah. Never. What, is it now a big thing that you can't go on a stage? No, no, no. I just don't like it. Just don't like it. Yeah. I don't like it. And the advantage of being so ancient is that I can say what I'm not going to do. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yes. Well, very good. Very good. Well, Simon, it's good to know that you're still helping us solve some of life's most important dilemmas. <laughs> But in any case, that was. And so, Dino, we come, you will no doubt be delighted to know, to the end of our little outing. It's been so much fun chatting with you. Thank you for having us, and thank you for being on the show. Thank you very much. I think I'm probably just about survived. <laughs> And dear listeners, thank you for being with us. If you've enjoyed listening, why not subscribe to the show wherever you listen so that you don't miss out on upcoming Take A Pew fun. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter or X, TikTok and now even on threads. When will the proliferation of social media ever stop, I ask myself. And that just leaves us with the sad news that that was in fact the final episode of season three of the Take A Pew podcast. We'll be taking a teeny little break, but fear not, because before you know it, Simon and I will be back to bring you plenty more fun, faith and flights of fancy in a brand new season, which we are planning to call season four. <laughs> <laughs> so keep your eyes and ears open for that. But in the meantime, it's Toodle Pip from me. And Tatty Bye from me. Join us again next season as we take a pew. Take a